you cannot help but do these four steps. You didn't have to learn these. You don't really need to hear me sharing this. But, well, maybe you do. And maybe, more importantly than you, maybe I do. <coughs> That's a talk I'll do one of these days on divine selfishness. Because it's all about me, and it's all about you. And at the same time, it is about us. All of the above. So, this is the only way that manifestation works in the universe. That's why I can stand here and say unconditionally, you have done these four steps all your life. What we are about here is remembering how the universe operates, reminding each other of how the universe operates, and then as friends, as community, as a congregation in spirit, supporting one another in creating our dreams. Because your dreams matter tremendously. And your dreams must come true. It's why you're here. Don't doubt that. One of our awakened dreamers, Judy Charlick, is going to uh, share with us now the manifestation of one of her longest held dreams. My dream is coming true, and I am so excited to share it with you. I have had two passionate interests in my life from when I was very young until now. One is flowers, and even as a toddler, they brought me extreme joy in their beauty. And the other is doing ceramics. I learned to throw when I was on um, Potter's Wheel when I was 16 years old, and I just loved it. And then uh, college and marriage and a family and a professional life came in, and I didn't do pottery for a long time. And then in the 80s, I uh, had the opportunity to join a potter's co-op. And I bought myself a wheel, a potter's wheel. And I bought myself a kiln and had those in my basement after um, I left the co-op. Because I had decided that in 1988 that I would get a PhD and move into teaching at the college level. So I, um, I did that, but I promised myself that I would get back to pottery when I retired. Fifteen years later, I did retire, but I took a, a part-time job that was part-time pay and full-time work with uh, <laughs> a, a federal, on a federal grant with a friend. And of course, I remembered my dream because Every time I went down in the basement, I would see my potter's wheel and my kiln gathering dust, and I would actually choke up. I knew that it was really deeply important to me. But um, this federal grant ended, and still I didn't get back to pottery. And it was that I doubted that I could get back to the level of skill that I had had before. But finally, people kept encouraging me, and, and my mother did, especially, thanks to mothers. And uh, I, I did start back to pottery, working at Cleveland State University, and also set up my powder wheel and my kiln at home, but I still didn't fire at home, because I didn't think I could. Um, so, that was about eight years ago, and seven years ago, I started studying Japanese flower arrangement called Ikebana. And that also had been a, a, a passion of mine, to learn to do flower arranging. And along in there, I can't remember the time frame, but Valerie Hornack was looking for somebody to help her doing uh, flowers for weddings. And we connected with a, a spark. And um, I helped her some, so that helped fulfill something of my dream. But the Ikebana was particularly um, attracting to me. Five years ago, I decided, and this was all gradual, 
Then I was going to focus on Ikebana container, that's what they call vases, Ikebana container ceramics. And I declared my intention to become a nationally known source for Ikebana containers and have customers coast to coast. That was, that was a stand out of nothing. You know, no evidence, just the way it works. So um, I worked on it and worked on it through progress and setbacks and started selling pieces to the Ikebana friends in the chapter here in Cleveland and uh, had a couple of shows at my teacher's house and got a lot of encouragement. And they would say, oh, Judy, you're so much better than you used to be. <laughs> <laughs> that was true, but it was <laughs> a little hard to hear. <laughs> and then, um, two years ago, friends from uh, Ikebana International Chapter in Rochester, New York, invited me up there, and I sold $2,000 worth of stuff. That was a big breakthrough. One year ago, I was invited to a conference in Chicago to sell uh, my pieces for teachers from around the country who teach Ikebana. And that was another huge breakthrough, because now there are a few people who knew me coast to coast. Then, um, three weeks ago, I uh, was invited to show and sell my work in Washington, D.C., and actually Northern Virginia. There's an Ikebana International chapter there. And particularly one, one style of Ikebana, there's a lot of different styles, but this one had brought in their headmaster from Japan. And therefore, there were people celebrating this 35th anniversary of the chapter from all over the country, from California to Massachusetts. And um, so, I, uh, so three things came out of this that are just thrilling me. One is that I sold $6,000 worth of stuff. Woo! Woo! <laughs> and now I have to get a business license and a, <laughs> a, a checking account, a business checking account, and all of that. Start ch charging tax. Uh, but that's a good thing. <laughs> the second thing is that um, I have six uh, chap chapters in six cities, not countries, that'll come, in um, six different cities that want me to come and show and sell my pieces there. And then the third thing is that people there, it was a three-day workshop, and uh, they uh, started asking me, could you do this design, could you do this design? And some of the designs, I, I can, some of the designs were particular to the headmaster and his father. And so I, um, but people can't get them in the United States. So I got up my courage on the third day and I asked the headmaster, saying what I just said, and that, and could I have his permission to reproduce some of these designs? And he said, yes. <laughs> <laughs> so now I'm, I'm, I've been anointed the uh, supplier for these particular designs in the United States of America. And Canada, too. So, it's, um, it's, it, it thrills me. I want you to know that your dreams can come true. You just work on it and, and keep your head down working and put your head up and celebrate. And, um, and that will happen to you, too. all the steps between oh, no. that declaration and meeting the Japanese master? Oh, no. Impossible. I mean, there was just no way. She, she didn't visualize, like, and I'm going to meet a Japanese master. <laughs> I mean, Judy's good, but... <laughs> Maybe you are. No, I just... Uh, also you want to sell your truck. But she didn't. And she didn't have to. She didn't have to. 
She didn't have to see the whole way. What she did do is recognize the desire and the dreams of her heart and to begin to move in that direction. One of the most powerful tools that we have, that you have, that you've already, I said, you've already used every tool. You have every tool you need to create anything you want. You have it now. You don't have to go find it. You don't have to buy a book. You don't even have to listen to another talk. <laughs> I hope you do. You don't, I mean, you have every tool right now to create whatever you want to create. So, the, one of the most powerful tools that you and I have is, is the, the power of visualization and what supports our visualization. Because we are all very visual creatures. Even those who have lost their sight are still visual beings. So I want to share with you six simple, specific steps, brief steps, about empowering and supporting your visualization. The first step is, it's one of those cosmic does, is visualize. Visualize what your dream is once a day. Now, we're going to start here. You received a pencil when you came in. And I'd like you to take the pencil, and I'd like you to write on the back of your bulletin, this is just for you, you're not handing them in. I want to see what your dreams are. <laughs> I want to, these are for you. I want you to write down two dreams, not just one, two dreams that you currently have. Start by, by writing down I dream. Don't say of. Say, I dream I am. I dream I am. And then write what it is. So you're stating it as a completed fact. It is already done. Writing, go right ahead. So, step one. You know what your dream is. You want to visualize your dream once a day, every day, for five to ten minutes. Why, why just five to ten minutes? If ten's good, isn't uh, 15 or 20 or 30 even better? The answer is, I don't think so. In short, the answer is no. It's not better. Because when we visualize more than five to ten minutes in a day, then we, we shift from be, being creative dreamers to being daydreamers. And when we become a daydreamer, we begin to live we begin to live in the future. We are not grounded in the present. And where is all of your power? In the present moment. So you disempower yourself when you're daydreaming. But there is a place for dreaming, an essential place for dreaming, and there is creative dreaming. And creative dreaming is done in short, powerful, and passionate bursts. From years of experience of many, many people, five to 10 minutes a day has proven to be effective, not more. Number two, imagine the details of your dream. Allow your dream, your vision, your visualization to be as real as possible in every shape, size, color, texture, aroma, 